All right, thanks, Dr. Rubino. Next up, last one, evaluation and treatment of common knee injuries. We have Dr. Matthew Lawless, Associate Professor, Board Certified Orthopedic Surgery, and the special, with the specialty of Orthopedic Surgery Sports Medicine. He is a fellowship trained in sports medicine, focuses on all knee problems as well as adult reconstruction and general orthopedics. He earned his medical degree from the University of Louisville, and completed an internship and residency at Wright State University, Bouchoff School of Medicine, as well as in medicine, and he is a, serves as the team physician for Wright State University Athletic and Fairborn High School. So, welcome, Dr. Law. Hey, good morning. Um, this is a small enough crowd. If you guys have questions as we go along, please feel free to interrupt and ask. Um, so, essentially, we're going to talk about uh, three injuries today MCLs, meniscus tears, and ACL tears. We'll talk about the treatment of them and the return to play. Um, I'm going to use Dr. Ellis intermittently as a subject to demonstrate examples. Um, so typically, when I cover events, the athletic trainer does most of the on-the-field work, at least initially. When I'm covering an event myself, first thing I do is kind of scan the field, make sure everyone's up. If someone is down, kind of watch and see how they're doing. If I go out first, the first thing I do is ask the athlete um, what's hurt, if it's not a head or a neck or anything, and they're not have any signs of unconsciousness. I ask them to sit up and ask them if they can stand and walk. Um, I try to get them off the field as quick as possible. Try to keep in mind that there's parents up there watching, that there's fans watching, everyone's nervous, so I try to get them up and off the field as quick as possible to let everyone know they're somewhat okay. I then take them to a more controlled situation. I think it's very difficult to try to perform an on-the-field evaluation, so I usually get them off at least to the sideline, uh, if I think they can not return to play the rest of the game, then I'll usually take them even into the locker room and get a much better exam. Um, while I'm talking to them and walking them off the field, I usually watch, watch how they walk, check any pain areas, ask them a history on their way out, foot pop, was a foot planted, pop, ever happened before, where's the pain? Um, when I first see them and get them to a table, go to the G1. Just sit on the edge here. So when I first see someone for an exam, I'm assuming it's a knee injury at this point, and I will. First thing I do is rotate their hips back and forth. So I internally rotate their hip, externally rotate the hip, make sure there's nothing going on up there. With my other hand, I kind of mash down here at the ankle, make sure there's nothing tender or swollen down there. Then that gives me an, an opportunity to look at their knee. A lot of times I'll start with the opposite knee and I'll press on that first to let them know what normal pressure feels like. And then I'll jump to the injured extremity and start palpating there. When I finally get past that point, I have them lay down. <coughs> uh, up a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I do is make sure their heels are on the table. Then you can see his feet are pointed up in the air. I tell him to relax. And when he relaxes, his feet fall off to the his feet fall off to the side. First thing I do is then again check the opposite leg, the non-injured leg. So I'm assuming this leg's injured. So I grab his non-hurt non leg, check how much hyperextension he has. That gives me a baseline. Check his motion. Check to see if there's any swelling in that leg. I then go to the injured extremity and do the same thing. Check for any swollen, swelling. Obviously I'll be standing on that side of the table when I do that. I go into hyperextension. See where this soreness is bend him up and start palpating for any soreness. I then do a recursive, I then do a ligament exam, starting again on the injured, on the non-injured leg. I do a Lachman exam, keeping his heel down. 
putting my hand behind here to make sure his hamstrings are loose, pulling forward, making sure I feel an intact ACL, take his leg off to the side. When I examine his medial and lateral collateral ligaments, I have his thigh supported by the table. I use my thigh as a lateral post, my hand as a medial post, and do a little varus valgus stressing just like that. Go into full extension, do the same thing. Questions, comments? Yes? What does it feel like when you have ligament laxity? You can move him around pretty much. That's why I always do the opposite leg first. Everyone is different. Some people are real tight, you can hardly move them at all. Other people are wiggly waggly. So you do the opposite leg first and then go to the other leg so you establish the baseline. And that's why you always examine the other leg first, especially for hyperextension, because that gives you the baseline of how they should be, provided they don't have a previous injury on the non injured legs. Other questions? So the first thing we're going to talk about is an MCL injury. So the MCL is the ligament that runs over here from proximal to distal. They're usually injured in one of two places, either proximal or distally. So over there or down there. Rarely it's a mid-substance, usually it's proximal or distal. The history for it is usually foot planted, usually a, <clears throat> a contact injury where they hit the lateral side, tearing it. So, the way I make my diagnosis, again, I've gotten my history, I see how they're walking, I bend their leg up, see where they're sore. They're sore up here at the joint line, sore down here. If it really is an MCL, a proximal MCL will be tender right over the medial epicondyle. Provided he does have a proximal MCL, then when I do my stressing on him, it should hurt, and then I also grade the laxity. <clears throat> laxity for MCLs is one, two, three. One is very little laxity, two is more laxity, three is laxity and extension. So I check them at 30 first. If it's an MCL, they're going to say, ouch. I'll see how much they open, see where they stop, and then go to full extension. Again, laxity and full extension is a grade three. If they do have an MCL, then I also go through my other exams too. Do a Lockman's, make sure their ACL is intact, do a posterior drawer, which is this. So I do a posterior drawer, I'm checking the PCL. I keep their foot in a neutral alignment, sit on their heel, make sure they're relaxed, and push posteriorly. Again, I know how far they should sag back because I've examined their other side. <clears throat> Treatment of an MCL. Initially, it is pain control, so ice and Tylenol. I usually stay away from anti-inflammatories on, on most injuries, especially MCLs, because they've been shown to slow down healing. So if the athlete has discomfort, I give them uh, Tylenol only. <clears throat> the question is to brace or not MCL injuries, and I usually do not brace. And the reason I do not brace is because in a normal person, the mechanical axis, so if you drew a line from the center of the hip to the center of the ankle, where it bisects the knee is where a majority of the weight goes through the knee. And most people, the medial side of the knee takes about 60% of the weight, and the lateral side takes about 40% of the weight. Meaning that when you're standing, the medial side is in compression. So I usually do not brace MCL injuries because weight-bearing walking compresses the medial side. Occasionally in a high grade 3 that's very symptomatic, I will put a brace on them, but I usually do not. Occasionally, I will put a brace on somebody if it can get them back playing quicker. A wide receiver in football, an interior lineman in football. Some sports you can get people back playing quicker with an MCL brace. Other sports like soccer where they're kicking, it's a lot harder to. Um, <clears throat> return to play for a medial collateral ligament injury is functional. When the athlete's able to do their normal job, then they can go back playing. Proximal MCL injuries seem to be a bit stiffer, 
seem to be a bit more swollen, but seem to heal a lot quicker. So it's usually two to four weeks for a proximal MCL. A distal MCL, usually not as swollen, usually not as stiff. They can usually get back playing sooner, or later, rather. Questions about MCLs? Yes? Um, when you, some, some college games, you see all the interior linemen have braces. Are Great they, question. Are they yeah. or is that just yeah. all getting messed up? So uh, there's been a study or two that's shown that prophylactically bracing interior linemen will help lower the incidence of MCL injuries. So especially the Big Ten seems to be the one that you always see the braces hanging out from under their uniforms, and they're doing that to prevent MCL injuries. That's the only thing that's been shown to prevent. Meniscus tears. So a meniscus tear, again, the foot is usually planted. It's usually a medial meniscus that gets torn first. There's usually an effusion, they usually tender to palpation over the joint, and they usually have positive McMurray's. So I'll show the McMurray's in a second, but the way you usually do it is rotation, flexion, rotation, and extension. So what you're trying to do is if this is a meniscus tear right here, you can see what you're trying to do with your provocative testing with the McMurray's is trying to grab this little piece here and pinch it to get it to pull. Meniscus tears hurt right here where the meniscus is still attached. Meniscus itself does not have any nerves, so the meniscus doesn't hurt, but it's where this piece is attached and being pulled, it causes the pain. That's why that joint line tenderness right there. So someone with a medial meniscus tear will have tenderness right here at the joint line. And what you're doing with the McMurray's is you have that little piece there, you're trying to flex him up, engage it. So I'm starting with it slightly rotated, flexing him, now I'm coming the other way, and I'm keeping a various stress on him as I go into extension. With the meniscus tear, I keep my finger, finger here, here too. Sometimes you can feel a pop when you do this, but it should elicit pain as you go into extension, as you're grabbing that piece and pulling it on the capsule. <clears throat> Most times, I do not get an MRI for a meniscus tear. Clinical accuracy is 70 to 90%. You can see the accuracy is for an MRI scan. That is an MRI scan of a meniscus tear. You can see that white line running through the meniscus there is the tear. Normal meniscus is a black triangle, and that white tear is indicative of the tear, that white line. So when I think an athlete has a meniscus tear, or I confirmed a meniscus tear, then I see their, how symptomatic they are and let their symptoms determine if they need to do anything more aggressive. Um, if I try to rehab them and get them back playing and they can't do it because of the symptomatic meniscus tear, then the next step is an arthroscopy. With an arthroscopy, you're doing one of two things, either repairing the tear, <coughs> if it's a clean, healthy, non-degenerative tear. If it's a degenerative tear, then the option is debriding it. So an example of a non-degenerative tear would be more something like this, whereas these tears here seem to be more the degenerative type tears. So again, the degenerative type tears like this and this, I would debris, something like this I would repair. Here is an example of how you would do a repair. So if this is an arthroscopy, and here a scope is in through that portal here anteriorly, and you're shuttling sutures through in this tear here, and you can see how we did that right here. So we're essentially passing sutures through here to take this torn piece, putting it back against the capsule. The debridement is simply taking the torn tissue that's all degenerative and debriding it back to a stable area there. So you can see here, we've gotten rid of that loose flap, and now we're back to healthy tissue. The return to play after an arthroscopy like this is usually a week or so. The return to play after a tear is six weeks or more. Questions about meniscus tears? 
Adam. <coughs> ACL tears. So most ACL tears are non-contact tears. Um, an interesting story, I uh, took care of my um, friend's son who tore his ACL playing soccer last year. I was sitting with him at a game and a player from the other team jumped, landed, his foot was planted, had the valgus stress, pop, swollen, and the dad could even tell, he's like, he tore his ACL, didn't he? So his dad was smarter than the team doctor, the other team that went over and told him his knee was fine. But, um, most times it's non-contact, it's an awkward landing, they feel a pop, have the onset of pain, usually um, are unable to continue playing. They have an effusion, laxity with their Lachmans. So the first thing I do is check for swelling. Usually they swell up pretty quickly. Most people that have ACL tears are tight in extension, meaning that when I check their hyperextension, their so their ACL is torn, and when it tears here, this piece right here in the tibia flops forward. So when you go into extension, it gets impinged here against the top of the notch there. So most ACL tears are tight when you go like this. They say, ouch, that hurts right up in front there. Then I do a Lachman exam on them. Pull forward, they should have laxity. And then I try to do a flexion rotation drawer. So what I'm doing with that is reproducing the pivot shift. I'm, I usually control their foot here, control their proximal tibia with my hand here, internally rotate their hips, and then slide like that. If they have a ACL tear, they will be dislocated, and then when you go like this, it will reduce the tear. And you can control with your hand here how much jump you can get them to do if they're torn. About half the people with ACL tears also have meniscus tears. However, the joint line tenderness isn't necessarily indicative of a tear. Um, there's so much bruising that goes on with an ACL tear. When you palpate along the joint line, if they're sore, it doesn't necessarily mean a meniscus tear. It may be bruising. The treatment for an ACL tear is an arthroscopy. That's the first thing you start with to address the meniscus. As I said, 50% of ACL tears have meniscus tears. Also check the chondral damage. And then the most important thing about ACL surgery is the tunnel placement. The correct tunnel placement, so if this is the footprint, so this is a um, picture of a tibia. You can see the meniscus here. Here's the medial meniscus. Here's the lateral meniscus. Here you can see the tibial footprint of the ACL. So when we do ACL reconstruction, we're trying to put a graft across that replicates where the graft was in the native position. ACL tears usually don't heal. On the rare instance they do heal, it's usually combined with other ligaments. You can't sew it back together. When it tears, it usually looks like a mop end, and you can't suture them back together. So that leaves reconstruction as your only alternative. And what you're trying to do with the reconstruction, again, is you're drilling a tunnel, and you're drilling a tunnel here, and then you're passing your graft through your tunnels. So the graft on the tibia, you want to come out in the footprint, usually towards the posterior medial aspect of the footprint, so right about here. And on the femoral side, the femoral footprint is about like this. You want to get on the back end of that. Graft choices, there's a lot of talk in the ACL literature and with sports medicine people about what Graphs to use, I usually use bone tended bones. So, what we're doing here is uh, if you remember that other slide, we have our tunnels drilled, we have to harvest a graft. So, the teller tendon is about three centimeters wide. I harvest the middle centimeter. Take a little piece of bone from the patella, a little piece of bone from the tibia, take that out and feed this bone plug into our tibial tunnel, this bone plug into our femoral tunnel. And those bones heal the bones and become that ACL. Christian, do you take the old ligament out of the one store and replace them? Correct. Correct. Um, 
and part of the surgery I debrief the old ACL stump. Yes. Another option that probably at least as popular as the bone tendon bone is the hamstrings of the pes tendons. There's three pes tendons here. The hamstring people pick two of them. Another option is allografts, who use cadaver grafts. Um, and there's variations, any kind of different allografts are possible. I try to stay away from allografts. Well, I never use allografts because of a higher failure rate. Return to play after an ACL is a lot trickier than an MCL and a meniscus tear. But oh, thanks for the time. Um, the first thing we do with an ACL tear is essentially a hierarchy. So I start with motion. I get their motion back first as soon as they have adequate motion. And I go to quad control. Once they're able to do quad control and they have their motion, then you go to strengthening. Once their strengthening starts coming up, then you can start doing endurance work. This usually takes anywhere from four to six months um, depending on the graft you use. Once they're able to practice, then they can finally return to play. I usually don't brace any of the athletes. I never brace any of the athletes that I've done an ACL reconstruction on. It usually takes about two to three weeks for that bone plug to heal in. So by a month's time, those bone plugs have already anchored themselves in the tunnels. So it's just a matter of modeling the graft at that point. Questions about ACL tears? Questions in general? Is you were talking about this bone to bone versus hamstring? Yes. Is there one that I smile because it's it's so it's so debated. Rubino, Joe, um, yeah, so which one's he uses hamstrings a good amount of the time. I, I never use hamstrings. I think there's I, I would rather have bone to bone healing. It's a re renewable source. When I take the graft, does it matter about the patient uh, age, health, and all that kind of stuff? Does it have who they are as to which one you would choose? Um, the downside to so the reason people use hamstrings instead of the bone tendon bone is just hurts a little bit more for the first week or two. The rehab's a little rough for the first couple of weeks because this is a little bit more uncomfortable. Is it more um, chance of... Your daughter had a hamstring, didn't she? She had a hamstring. Yeah. <laughs> I was just wondering, you know. <coughs> um, that's great. So. Yeah, ham, it, you know, and that's what, hamstring, bone, tendon, bone, in the literature, they're both pretty equal. Yes. And so who would avoid a hamstring in? The literature currently says that if you're a small female, you probably want to avoid a hamstring because the tendons are too small. Um, That's my daughter, though. She's very small. Exactly. But she's done great. I mean, you can tell me a little bit, and she can't maybe pull her knee up, touch your thigh, thigh as as well as the other side. But she's so athletic, she's made it almost. You know, right. So right. Yeah, I mean, that's the... Can't really tell. On exam, if you lay hamstring people down on their belly and ask them to flex up, yeah, their hamstring site inevitably can never flex up as high. But that usually doesn't mean all that much of a functional difference. And someone that does a lot of sprinting, I would discourage a hamstring use in someone from that because when you do sprint, you do kick your butt with your hamstring. But uh, that's probably who I'd stay away from in the hamstring. But now, why does that make a difference if should or sprint? Because then that's part of her. Because it may right? potentially slow them down a little bit. <coughs> oh, sprint? You mean like uh, for that? Yeah, point? yeah, so they're an athlete. Oh, yeah, 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 like a soccer player. It doesn't hurt anything if they do it. No, 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 it doesn't. Okay. No, okay. no, 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 no. Okay. Yes? Um, I was seeing in my shoulder, there's a little bit of research in terms of post op functional outcomes in terms of male to female. Yeah. They, there's a lot of research out there that shows that like they talk about the neuromuscular training to prevent ACL injuries, but the female population are much more front dominant or quad dominant than hamstring. So, is there anything out there that shows, you know, by taking a hamstring graft that's going to so possibly the, set them up for further complications? So, the what you would look at for that is retear rate. Right. Because you would think if you're tearing, taking the hamstring, then you're making them more front dominant and you'd be more out of your reach there. 
No, the retail rate is pretty similar in the bone tendon bone or a hamstring. Other questions? All right. Thanks, Dr. Lawless, and congratulations to everyone. You made it. That was it. This is the closing remarks, which is thanks for coming. Apparently, your CME award or your requirements, the evaluation is required for that. So if you want to fill that in and you pre-registered, you may get your certificate today before you leave. So fill out your evaluations, hand them to Sydney at the door, and she may have her your certificate for you. Um, the other thing I'd say with the evaluations, feel free to give us ideas, things that you would prefer to see in the future, other things like that we would take into consideration. But other than that, have a good day and enjoy the 